the angel of the Crimea. For the first three years of their married life, the wealthy young William Nightingale and his wife Fanny toured the European continent, a great undertaking in the days of the early 1800s. In the spring of the year 1820, they, with their one-year-old baby daughter, Parthenope, were staying in the city of Florence, Italy. There on May 12th... Just think, we have another little daughter, my dear. She and Parthy can grow up together, play together, and go to all the wonderful parties together. What shall we name our new baby, dear? Hmm, well, let's see. I think a name should have some meaning, some significance. <laughs> yes, I know. You named our other little girl Parthenope because she was born in Naples, and you said the ancient Greeks called that city Parthenope. Why, of course. Let's name this one Florence. We're staying here in Florence just now. It's gay, vibrant city. How about it? Florence it is. We do want her to become a gay, vibrant young lady. We'll call her Flo for short. But I must say, I hope we never have a child born in Constantinople. I can just hear you naming the poor baby, Constantinople Nightingale. <laughs> Shortly after Florence's birth, the young couple took their two daughters back to England, where they established two homes, Lee Hurst for the summer months and Embley Park for the winter. As Florence grew older, she showed remarkable concern for sick animals and sick people while her sister was more interested in homemaking and entertaining. Mrs. Nightingale saw to it that her daughters were taught the accomplishments and graces that would make them elegant young ladies in a fashionable society. Mr. Nightingale was more concerned with the development of their minds. Uppermost in Florence's mind, however, was her concern for the sick. She wanted to be a nurse. When she was 14, she discussed this ambition with a family friend, Mr. Gifford. Mr. Gifford, ever since I was very young, I've wanted to be a nurse. I want to work in a hospital with sick people all around me. I want to do something useful, and this seems to me to be the best way. But Parthy just laughs at me. She says nurses are dreadful people. But do they have to be that way? I wouldn't be. No, my dear girl, you couldn't be dreadful. But a nurse, that's not for you. Why not? Well, you're a gentleman's daughter. A lady, and hospitals are dreadful places, filthy, vulgar, immoral. Not a fit place at all for a person of your social standing. But they don't have to be like that. I would make them better, make them clean, maybe even build my own. Listen, Florence, why don't you just content yourself to marry some nice young gentleman, raise a devoted family, do charitable works, and serve God in that manner? You sound just like my mother, Mr. Gifford. I'm afraid you just don't understand. It was true. Mr. Gifford didn't understand. Mrs. Nightingale didn't understand. Parthy didn't understand. And Mr. Nightingale didn't understand. But he was somewhat more sympathetic toward Florence's overwhelming desire to care for the sick. Her mother kept thinking of new schemes to crowd the idea of nursing from Florence's mind. William, dear? I think it's about time for us to take the girls on a trip to the continent. Visit Italy, France, Switzerland, and other places. Hmm. Well, you may be right. I have taught the girls all the languages, but they need to study the art, culture, architecture, and other things. Be a good way to round out their education. And I was thinking it might help Florence to get her mind off this nursing business. Mm -hmm. True, it might. But I wouldn't count on it. I had just about made up my mind that if she hasn't gotten over this in a few more years, I'd give her a hospital of her own. Then at least we'd know what she was doing. William, how could you? It would bring disgrace to all of us. That's not the answer. We must get this notion out of her head, and I think a trip to the continent would do it. The trip was a social and educational success. Florence made careful notes of everything, and at every opportunity, she visited the benevolent institutions such as hospitals, orphanages, and prisons, studying them carefully. When they returned to England, the girls were caught up in a whirl of gaiety. 
Their lives were crowded with parties, balls, and suitors. Outwardly, Florence was witty and gay and seemed contented with her life as a young lady of fashion. But inwardly, she was restless and unhappy. In the summer of 1844, an American, Dr. Samuel Ward Howe, visited the Nightingale Estate at Embley. One morning, Florence approached him as he walked in the Rose Garden. Dr. Howe? Yes, Miss Florence. Will you answer a question for me, honestly and frankly? Well, I'll try. Dr. Howe, if I should decide, really decide to devote my whole life to nursing, do you think it would be such a dreadful thing? No. No, not dreadful, but unusual. And in England, whatever is unusual is thought of as unfitting. Oh, yes, I know. Everyone tells me that. And that still doesn't change your mind about nursing. No. I want to do it more than anything. I'm sure it's what God wants me to do. I feel that nursing is my true vocation. Then that is what you must do. Pursue it to the best of your ability. God will help you. Oh, thank you, Dr. Howe. You are the first person to really encourage me. Father sympathizes, but you have encouraged. Yet even with Dr. Howe's encouragement, Florence could find no way to break the ties that bound her to her fashionable family. She was torn between her sense of duty to her parents and sister and her dream of entering a hospital to study nursing. As an attractive young lady, she led a gay social life with many eligible young men seeking her company. Oh, Florence? Oh, hello, Tom. Your mother said I'd find you in the Rose Garden. Yes, it's my favorite spot at night. But why aren't you in enjoying the party with the rest? I was looking for you. I don't seem to enjoy it much without you. <laughs> what were you thinking about when I came out? My thoughts were far away. Oh, why must your thoughts always be so far away? Can't we talk about us tonight? It's a beautiful night, a night for us to dream about our future. Future? I don't know. I, I just don't know. Florence, I love you. We can have a glorious future together. Marry me, please, and make me the happiest man in the world. Oh, Tom, I do love you ever so much. I hope you understand, but... But what? I promise I'll make you happy. I know that. But what right have I to my own selfish happiness when so many people are sick and miserable? People I could help with these two perfectly good hands. Who says it's selfish happiness? Isn't it unselfish to make me happy? Tom, can't you understand that this is something I feel I must do? Right now, I can hear those children in the East End calling to me for a bit of food. I can hear sick men and women crying for someone to give them water, to ease the pain. Tom, it isn't that I don't care for you. And I love you for caring for those who need you, but can't we help them in some other way? I have a good inheritance. We'll have money to use for all the good works you want to do. Isn't that the sensible way to help? Maybe it's sensible, but... But, Tom, I guess I just can't be sensible. I feel I must give myself. But I won't take no for an answer. I can't give you any other answer. Then I wait. And while Tom waited and the Nightingales worried, Florence, now 32, grew more determined in her ambition to care for the sick. I know it's unheard of, Father. But does that mean a woman from a fine family can't be a nurse? It could be made such a fine, wonderful work. And hospitals could be clean, comfortable places. But they aren't clean and comfortable. They're not fit places for a woman of character and refinement. But they could be, Father. And I can help to change them. Florence, it's not fitting. Father, for a man of your integrity, that's a poor argument. All right. You've always been a fighter. If you're sure you know what you're doing, I'm ready to let you have your way. I know what I'm doing. I've visited hospitals all over Europe. All right, Florence. You do what you think is right, and I'll provide you with a substantial allowance. I'll not have it said that I didn't provide for my daughter. Oh, thank you, Father. And thank you for trying to understand. 
so Florence Nightingale studied to become a nurse and soon became known for her skill, sympathy, courage, and strength. At this time, England and France became involved in the Crimean War against Russia in Turkey. The reports in the London Times were disturbing. Listen to what it says in the Times this morning. It is with feelings of surprise and anger that the public will learn that no sufficient preparations have been made for the proper care of the wounded. Not only are there not enough surgeons, but there are no nurses. And even if there were, there is not even enough linen to make bandages for the wounded. But it's an outrage. Why doesn't someone do something about it? It's a pity all those poor wounded men out there dying. Well, it's bad enough to be killed in the war, but, but to die of neglect because there is not sufficient food, doctors and nurses, well, that is outrageous. But I thought the Turks had turned over to the British a building in Skatari to be used as a hospital. Yes, but listen to what it says here. Those who live to reach the barracks hospital at Scutari find themselves with weak old wounds never touched by the hands of medical men being shoved rudely into cold, damp, bare places where the commonest appliances of a sick ward are missing. Shameful. Absolutely shameful. It's a disgrace, that's what it is. Why doesn't someone do something? It was at this time in mid-October that Florence Nightingale received a letter that greatly influenced her life. Dear Miss Nightingale, you have undoubtedly read the reports in the papers of the horrible conditions existing in our army hospital at Scutari. After much deliberation, I have come to the conclusion that there is just one way to remedy this lamentable situation. Nurses must be sent to Scutari, and they must be strictly supervised and directed. And you, Miss Nightingale, are the only person I know of in all England capable of organizing and superintending such a plan. I realize that this scheme is somewhat revolutionary, as none but male nurses have ever been admitted to military hospitals before. It is my wish, however, that you accept my plan and consent to superintend this seemingly formidable task. I do not say one word to urge you. I know you will come to a wise decision. God grant it may be in accordance with my hopes. Sincerely, your friend, Sidney Herbert, Secretary of War. Will I go? This is what I've been waiting for. A chance for real service. Scarcely a week later, she left London with 38 nurses she had personally interviewed and selected. At the French port of Marseille, Florence purchased with her own money a large quantity of supplies she thought might be needed at the barracks hospital. Early in November, the weary and seasick group disembarked and walked the steep quarter-mile road to the hospital. Just inside the courtyard doorway, they stopped. Miss Nightingale, it's horrible. Look at that gory, rotting mess. Oh! <gasps> What is it? No, oh, that's just another leg to add to the heap. Oh. Operating room's right up there. The doctors just throw the amputated parts out the window. Uh -oh. The heap gets bigger every day. And rats! Just look at them everywhere! We have to work in these conditions? Oh, I didn't expect it to be this bad. Ladies, did you come to work or to complain? Oh, well, I'm sorry, Miss Nightingale. I guess we forgot. All right. Orderly, this debris must be cleaned up and uh, hauled away. Yeah, but... Uh... Well, the courtyard must be cleaned and the pavement scrubbed immediately. Yes, ma'am. You ladies, come with me. We'll see what awaits us inside the hospital. The conditions inside the hospital were no better than those in the courtyard. The building had been transformed into a hospital simply by slapping on a coat of whitewash. Beneath the floors were cesspools and open sewers ventilation and plumbing were woefully deficient. The stench was indescribable. Rats, mice, and crawling vermin were everywhere. We've got to clean this place up. Ladies, get scrub brushes and pails and get to work. But there aren't any cleaning supplies. Uh, yes, yes. Here's some money. See if you can buy pails, brushes, and soap. With your own money? But oh, don't worry about that. Let's get started. Oh, that poor man. I must loosen that bandage. It's much too oh, tight. Oh, 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 thank you, ma'am. That, that feels so much better. Who are you? Oh, Miss Nightingale. Doctor. Who told you to care for this patient? 
I helped him because he needed help. If you want to clean up this place, all right. But leave my patients alone. I have no time for meddlesome women in my hospital. I am not a meddlesome woman. I was sent here by the government to help these men, and I intend to do just that. And why are these men lying here with such filthy clothes on? Don't you have a laundry? Of course we have a laundry. They turn out six shirts a month. You mean six shirts a month for each man? No, I mean six shirts for all the men. Outrageous! Something's got to be done about that. That evening, Florence called her tired group together. Ladies, you have undoubtedly noticed that some of the doctors are somewhat hostile towards us. They do not appreciate our help. Now, no one, absolutely no one, must do anything for a patient unless ordered to do so by a doctor. The time will come when they will recognize the usefulness of a nurse. In the meantime, we will continue to do whatever we can. And believe me, there is plenty we can do. We must prove our usefulness by being ready day and night for any emergency. It wasn't long before the nurses had diet kitchens operating efficiently and a laundry running smoothly. More and more, the doctors called upon the nurses for assistance. Nurse, over here, please. Here, raise this man's head. Yes, doctor. I'll have to sew up that wound at once. Get my instruments and bandages. I have everything here, doctor, and hot water. Doctor? Doctor? Yes. There are two men who need attention at once, sir. Nurse, uh, stay with this man, please. Yes, doctor. Uh, Miss Nightingale, I've called you here for a special reason. Uh, and what is that, Doctor? Well, I've called you in to tell you that, well, I'm proud to have you and your group of dedicated nurses with us. Women like you belong in every hospital. Thank you, sir. It is my prayer that wherever nurses are needed, we shall serve faithfully. Florence Nightingale labored untiringly. She was known to spend as much as eight hours on her knees, dressing wounds and comforting the men. Sometimes she stood 20 hours at a stretch, assisting at operations, distributing supplies and directing the work of her nurses. Yet no matter how long or tiring the day had been, each evening she walked along the four miles of beds, making sure each patient was comfortable for the night. What's that? What? That light. Where's it coming from? Oh, that. Uh, you must be new here. That's Miss Nightingale. She comes by every night. We call her the lady with the lamp. Oh, she... She looks sort of like an angel. Well, she's an angel, all right. Some of the soldiers call her the angel of the Crimea. The long, hard winter slowly passed in Scutari. Finally, with the coming of spring, and with no thought for her own safety, Florence set out to visit the hospitals at Balaclava, closer to the scene of the war. And she also wished to visit the soldiers on the battlefield. Everywhere she went, the soldiers shouted their greetings. Miss Nightingale, I think we should turn back towards safer terrain. Oh no, let us continue ahead. We're getting too near the gunfire, Miss Nightingale. I want a view of the battle. Just then, a sentry darted from a bush, waving his arm. Turn away! Turn away! Sharp firing! I am Florence Nightingale. Well, the Russians will be very happy to aim at you, ma'am. Please, let me go on. I'm not afraid. No! No. Well, if you insist. Oh, Miss Nightingale, I plead with you. Please dismount. Take refuge. All right, I'll dismount. But I'm not taking refuge. I'm going into the trenches. Trenches? To be killed? I don't think so. Madam, if anything happens to you, let these gentlemen witness that I warned you of the danger, that I tried to stop you. My good young man, believe me, I am not afraid. On she walked through those narrow gashes in the earth. She touched the gun carriages and iron muzzles of the mortar cannon. She stepped on the ramparts. Finally, she climbed up and sat a moment upon the center mortar. Someone cried out. Behold the heroic daughter of England, the soldier's friend. Oh, Henceforth, this mortar shall be called Nightingale Mortar.
Ending the Crimean War was signed at Paris in 1856. By midsummer, the hospitals were empty, the last duty discharged. Florence was sailing home to England, utterly tired, but more than that, her health was seriously impaired. The people of England wished to do something for the soldier's friend. It was understood that the wish of her heart was a school of nursing, so a fund was started. And in a year, over $200,000 was raised. In 1859, Florence Nightingale began at St. Thomas's Hospital, the first lay training school for nurses. The first class of 13 young women was graduated in 1861, and with them began the promise of help to which the world turns in trouble the modern profession of nursing. Today, graduating nurses repeat, as did those first graduates, the words of the Nightingale Pledge. I solemnly pledge myself before God and in the presence of this assembly to pass my life in purity and to practice my profession 